An ambitious plan for a tertiary educated nation. The long awaited Universities Accord report's been released today with major changes recommended for course fees, income supports and student loan repayments. Education Minister Jason Clare joins us this morning. I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders. If Australia is going to prosper in the years ahead, we're going to need far more tertiary educated workers. That's the central finding of the Universities Accord report out today, which recommends sweeping changes to recruit more students, particularly from regional, remote and disadvantaged backgrounds. It's calling for a shake-up of course fees, more resources for regional unis, more financial support for those struggling to make ends meet while studying, and an overhaul of student loan repayments. Is the government up for such serious reform and investment? We'll find out soon. In the meantime, we're six days out from the Dunkley by-election, the first real test for Anthony Albanese and Peter Dutton this year. The Prime Minister's pitch to voters over the past week has been all about cost of living, talking up his tax cuts and better news on wage growth. While the opposition leader has been hammering away on his favoured ground, border protection. Anthony Albanese is under attack on national security tonight, with the opposition claiming border force is at breaking point. They've ripped a cumulative $600 million out of Operation Sovereign Borders. Complete nonsense once again uh, here from Peter Dutton. The budget papers show Labor's funding of border protection is $470 million more than the Coalition had promised. You're the one under fire this morning because Border Force Commissioner Michael Outram, a, a respected public servant, has actually asked political leaders not to politicise this issue. Do you accept that is exactly what you're doing? Well, well nobody's politicising the issue. You can't run a country or be an alternative government just based upon fear. That's all Peter Dutton has got. And his co-owner, Dad, Graham. Hey, Graham, Hi. how are you, mate? Yeah, you're good, mate. The opposition leader has been accused of launching a scare campaign over the cost of Australian cars. We should stand up as a country against uh, the Prime Minister's proposed great big new tax on cars and utes, a great big new car and ute tax. Labor's car tax. This huge new tax, great huge new tax. But it's all negative. He has nothing positive to offer the nation. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. New figures out today show wages are growing at their fastest rate in almost 14 years. Very encouraging, very pleasing, very welcome outcomes in the wages data today. The truth is, for most Australians, they've never had it worse. But we know that people are still under pressure and that's why our cost of living tax cuts are so important. We need to see a government absolutely focused on making sure that the purchasing power of Australians' pay packets continues to go up, not down. We know people are still under cost of living pressure, so it's certainly not job done. Thanks very much. My guest this morning is the Education Minister, Jason Clare. First, let's check what's making news. On the ABC website, Claudia Long, Connor Duffy and Shalila Medora focus on the call for needs-based funding, where extra loadings would be provided based on student and institutional disadvantage. To pay for some of the changes, a higher education future fund is recommended, with contributions from wealthier universities. The nine newspapers focus on this so-called tax on the top universities, and it quotes the Vice-Chancellor of Sydney Uni, Mark Scott, calling it a tax dressed up as a fund, and Deakin University's Vice-Chancellor warning against taxing philanthropic donations. News Corp papers focus on the recommended expansion of fee-free courses for people who didn't finish school, and the overhaul of the student loan program help. While the Australian poses the question, where will the money come from and does the government have the political will to commit to this reform? So no surprise, we're going to start uh, this morning with this blueprint for higher education. The overarching recommendation here is to boost the number of working age Australians with a university or TAFE qualification from 60 to 80 per cent by 2050. If that can't be done, Australia's economic prosperity will suffer. But none of this will be easy or inexpensive. Even high school retention rates have been sliding for the past five years. So if the government wants more kids finishing year 12, it really needs to do that before it can have any hope of lifting the number who then go to university. 
Let's see what the panel makes of it. I'm joined this week by Katina Curtis, Raf Epstein and Sarah Eisen. Very good morning to all of you. Katina, let's start with you on this big report. Many, I think it's 47 recommendations uh, in it and it covers so many areas of the sector. What are some of the, the most important recommendations here, do you think? Um, I think that, well, the funding overhaul, um, it's going to be expensive, basically, if the government agrees to do all the things in here. T talking about a return to proper demand-driven funding um, and uh, extra supports to increase the participation from students from disadvantaged groups. Um, a lot of this is sort of giving me deja vu to when Chris Evans was minister more than 10 years ago, um, demand-driven funding, increasing participation. Um, but there's also, on the other end of things, they're also talking about an overhaul of of um, the HEX help repayment system, um, which has, you know, got a lot of angst over the last year as amid rising cost of living, um, offering higher youth allowance to a lot more people um, and also the paid placements for really those key degrees in areas that we need, like health, um, you know, nursing, um, allied health professions such as because physiotherapy just to explain and that, teachers. You have to do these placements at the hospital that's or the school right. if you're a student. Yeah, so... Uh, it's my pretty hard to hold down another job, right? That's right. Why are you doing that? My brother's a physiotherapist and I remember when he went to uni, he was living away from home and he was actually at a regional uni and he had to do all these placements and they got increasingly longer, so I think by the final year of his course he had to spend it was three or four months um, working for free essentially it was full-time work Pretty it was away from where he was living it was yeah. very hard to do so the idea is to have some sort of payment um, who pays for that I'm sure there'll be uh, it's the biggest some argument you get a lot of calls and texts nurses right placement paying for placement yep number one issue teachers the same thing okay. they have to do pay placement and the report says it'd be a combination of industry and government now industry often is the state government, right? They own the hospitals yeah. and the schools. Yep. So there might be a bit of an argument over who, who pays for what there. Um, Raf, one of the immediate recommendations is to scrap the Morrison government's job ready graduates program. People might remember this was the, the scheme that's still in place that uh, reduced the cost of some courses like teaching and nursing and maths to try and encourage more people to take them up, but jacked up the cost of uh, arts degrees, humanities degrees, law degrees quite significantly. Yeah, so you're paying, I think it's about 16 grand Art student, law student, business student, all paying the same amount of money. The idea being to drive more of the jobs that we need. Very little evidence that it has the impact that they wanted it to have. Uh, people also thought at the time maybe it was a bit punitive as well for people who did arts degrees. There might be a bit of history between the coalition and a few arts well, graduates Because they're all lefties there. doing uh, arts, um, arts degrees. But the thing that really strikes me about that report is it's a little bit like Infrastructure Australia and Jobs and Skills Australia. If we want a plan, you've got to have someone to be in charge of the plan. At the moment, the unions used to get a bit of money and then each year they kind of ask for a little bit more. They're trying to set up some overarching thing to double the number of students and double the amount of funding. This is the, that's, that's commission. This is the yeah. commission that's uh, been recommended. We'll talk more about that with the Minister, but that, that's quite an interesting structural change, I suppose, to how funding is allocated amongst yeah. uh, institutions. Sarah... Um, look, as we've discussed, a whole bunch of recommendations do go to financial help for students, mm -hmm. uh, making loan repayments a little easier for um, those who've graduated, more money for struggling universities to lift the quality. Overall, heaps more money to double the number of students in the system. Totally. How, where's that all going to come from? Yeah, I mean, the government's been clear that it still has to do the costings. We've got a budget in May. But we definitely won't see exactly how it's going to respond. There might be a couple of uh, clues in the May budget, but they're going to take their time. You mentioned industry, you mentioned state, you mentioned the Commonwealth. It's not just going to be one, um, you know, one body that's responsible for this. But for some of the... Um, the things that need to be done, as Katina might have mentioned, there's that Higher Education Future Fund, which mm. is this new thing about trying to get unis to also put so a bit of So just explain money. how this, what, what the idea is here. Mm. So this is the thing that was called like the wealth tax, I guess, by Mark Scott yeah. and so on. So this is the idea that for things uh, like philanthropic uh, donations for, for international student fees and so on, you pay a bit of that, a sort of so a tax got, you, or a yeah, levy or something. Universities like Sydney Uni, Melbourne Uni, yep. New South Wales, right, they, they get a lot of international students. Mm -hmm. they presumably get a lot more donations, philanthropic donations mm. than, than others. So they would have to chip into this fund mm. and some of that would help the, the poorer universities. Essentially. And then I think particularly what it kind of would do, this fund, there'll be a lot from this that would help for that expansion of regional hubs, which you've heard the government mm. talk about, which is that, oh, to get us to lift the number of people going to universities particularly, they will have to come from regional areas, poorer areas, be First Nations people. And how do we do that? We need to make sure that they can study easily. So we need to expand the number of regional hubs for them to study in. 
who will pay for that? The unis, government, we're not sure. This is where that future fund could come in. This is where that infrastructure could come from, is this sort of $10 billion fund. But you already do see the unis talking about the sort of impact this is going to have, talking about a wealth tax, mm -hmm. um, a, a, an international student tax by stealth, and already talking about, you know, the GO8, which has the... the Biggest. That's the group of eight top unis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, so they're sort of saying, look, we, we invest £7.7 .7 annually in research. If you hit us with this tax, it's going to impact everything we do, including that. Oh, we so won't spend as much on research. Potentially. Yeah, right. There's a little bit of possible brinkmanship going on there. Isn't but it almost designed to fail? Like, there's so many people have to contribute, and it's actually not that well designed. Maybe, actually, that gives the government an out. They don't have to do it. What, the whole thing? No, just the head. Oh, the head. That fund. Yeah. No, no. Well, the whole thing, I mean, no. 400 Come pages, on, there's not much costing. Um, and I get no. having a wish list. But that fund and the wealth tax, it just gets more and more complicated, does it? Which makes it easier and easier. That's the, the only element in here where it does talk about trying to raise some funds. Yeah, Otherwise, the rest right. of it's coming from, from what? From, from government. Who knows where? Somewhere. But if we don't do it, Katina, it, the, the report's pretty clear. It's pretty stark. Yeah. That uh, we're heading for failure unless we do. We really absolutely need more people with the qualifications. And when, when you look at the um, where the jobs growth is, even just over the last couple of years, like it's m there's massive jobs growth far and above any other industry. Is in it's in the health and the services sector, and you can't do that if you're not don't have a qualification. And we need a plan, right? Um, I only learned this yesterday. We used to have a commission until the 80s that sort of did this. We built big unis in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. We stopped. We keep piling the students in. Monash is the biggest uni in the Southern Hemisphere. The big unis don't do well on student ratings because the, the students get lost in them. Yeah. So someone, there's a lot of really important questions in that report, a lot of really important goals. Someone's got to take control of it. But do the unis or the governments want to hand that control over to a commission? With the skills it's gap, though, something as well that's interesting is obviously there is a bit of talk about vet and vocational education here. But yeah. something that I wonder is paying for these placements, the teachers and the mm. nurses, I do wonder what that's going to do to the conversation for tradies regarding apprenticeships. You have a lot of the unions talking about how apprentices aren't paid a living wage. That's one of the reasons completion rates are so low. They can't afford to stay apprentices. Right. So now you've got this year-long plan, 400 pages, um, talking about the placements is one of the biggest things that's being discussed, paid placements. I'm curious about the trade sector and the unions, what they're going to say as the government starts looking at this. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Meanwhile, the Minister's also got this school funding issue to work out this year as well. Um, parking higher education for one moment. He's done a deal with WA, but the rest of the states want more than uh, that was offered in, in that deal. Uh, they did meet on Friday, but they've, they've got a series of meetings this year, I think, to, to work this out. You had the uh, Australian Education Union on Friday also ramping up the pressure on the Commonwealth to do something about public school infrastructure spending, so the mm. money that actually goes to the buildings and so on, and highlighting how much... Uh, some top private schools are spending on infrastructure, pools and gymnasiums uh, and so on. Uh, the, the, the figures were quite startling. I think, what was it, the five oh, top private schools? The five schools. top schools spent more on their capital funding in one year than 3,300 public schools, public schools oh, okay. spent on their capital stuff in the same year. Now, they do that, of course, because they, you know, parents pay fees, but also the, the union's pointing to what the Commonwealth provides, uh, and it says it needs to be providing more capital funding, more infrastructure funding to these public schools. When you go to schools and you see thousands of demountable classrooms, when uh, principals are saying that they don't have enough bathroom facilities, when teachers are saying that they don't have access to the high-quality STEM facilities, yeah, so that's another difficult one for uh, Jason Clare to land in and requires money too. The broader figure that the union were pointing to from the Productivity Commission, so I'm relying on the union here, but over the decade, the increase to public students per student from the feds is a 20, 21% increase. The increase to private school students is something like 37% over the decade. So in terms of where the money is flowing, it is a little bit like the universities conversation. Mm. There is a widening gap, and we know there is with housing, it, there clearly is with education, this widening gap between people who can afford to pay and those who can't afford to pay, but how you fix it again. It's always been this problem with school funding, though, that the, the state governments pay yep. most of the money to public schools and the federal governments pay mm. most of the money to private schools. And it, like, it's so complicated and there's sort of no way to kind of... The, the system that we've had is just built up over decades well, we do and have it's a standard, really hard. Right? We've got a Gonski developed yep. standard, but even yep. that is complex is in and of itself. One thing I mean, that comes up a lot, 
on talkback. I mean, this is guaranteed talkback fodder. There's nothing people Public like. versus talk private schools. Absolutely, yep. because yep. governments are subsidising something that parents can afford to pay for. One thing that I'm not too clear on, if you get some sort of federal or state government money, how much of a look does that government get at your endowment fund? Mm. Should they be looking at your endowment fund? If you are a Catholic, Muslim, Jewish, you know, small secondary college and you're educating people and you're charging, well, fine, good luck to you. You want some capital, some money? Great. If you're an established school and you're building a mock Scottish castle, or if you're building in like the, the which the, is not even a joke, the school that I went to has a leadership centre that costs more than 20 million. Down the road there is a wellness centre. At some point, it's very clear people want to go. Well, hang on, you've got a lot. They don't get heaps, but they do get something. And I think people really want to see a rebalancing. How you do it with a complex funding formula is hard, but the rebalancing yeah, all right. is well, hard. So all of this is linked, really. I mean, unless you can fix these problems in public schools to get more, uh, particularly the, the kids um, that we're talking about who need to be going to uni, they've, they've got to be looked after in the public school system. Yeah. Then you're going to lift those university and vocational education mm -hmm. uh, a, a attainment rates. Um, all of it's linked. All of it, as I say, is going to require some serious dollars. And this, this for labour in government um, is something people would expect, wouldn't they? What's everyone think about the appetite to actually do something? Yeah, I mean, it, as you say, it's a really core issue for Labor is education and mm. improving opportunity for everyone. Um, there has, I mean, they haven't shown a lot of appetite for very expensive things. I, mean, I think well, we're going to talk. And I was going to say, yeah, we're going to talk about the Navy later on. Like Richard a lot of money going to submarines. Managed to get Navy eleven billion dollars extra, but it's taken him eighteen months yeah. to to do that. Like, so it's yeah, the, right. where the money's well, from. Let's see what we can find out. Time to talk to the Education Minister Jason Clare, who will have a lot on his plate this year with both higher education reform and negotiating a new schools funding agreement. He'll also have that task of convincing his cabinet colleagues to back any new funding. So to recap on the university's accord, the report recommends boosting the tertiary attainment rate of all working age Australians from 60 to 80 per cent by 2050. As part of that target, it says the proportion of 25 to 34 year olds with a university education needs to increase from 45 to 55 per cent. Overall, the number of Commonwealth supported students at uni needs to double to 1.8 million. And the best way to do that is to lift attendance amongst those from regional, remote and disadvantaged backgrounds. The report says more income support will be needed. Payments should be available for nursing and teaching students who undertake PRAC placements, as we discussed, in hospitals and schools. And changes should be made to the student loan scheme HELP, which can be a crushing burden for those on low incomes. And when it comes to course fees, the report says the Morrison government's so-called Jobs Ready Graduate Scheme needs to be urgently replaced because it simply has not worked. This is the scheme that's made some courses like maths, teaching and nursing cheaper to encourage more enrolments, while making arts, humanities and law degrees far more expensive. So, Jason Clare, welcome to the program. Good day, mate. So when you look at the list of recommendations in this report, what do you believe are the most important and what are you willing to adopt? Well, I think I've made it pretty clear that my priority is helping more kids from the outer suburbs and the regions, more kids from poor families get a crack at university. Uh, at the moment, about one in two kids in their 20s and 30s have got a university degree, uh, but not in my neck of the woods, not where I grew up, and not in the regions. You know, what this report says, Dave, is that we've got to boost the number of, of people with either a TAFE qualification or a uni degree to 80% by the middle of the century. Think back about, you know, into the 1980s, look at what Bob Hawke and Paul Keating did. They boosted the number of kids finishing high school from 40% to almost 80%. It includes you and me, a lot of people watching the program. That's mm. nation-changing stuff. What this report says is that by the middle of the century, we need a workforce where people haven't just finished high school, 80% of people haven't just finished high school, but they've gone to TAFE or university as well. And that's no easy task. And what the report says is if we're going to do this, and we've got to do it, otherwise you've got an economy with a handbrake on. If we're going to do this, then you need to break that artificial barrier between TAFE and uni, make it easier for people to move between the two. And we've got to get rid of that invisible barrier that stops a lot of young people from poor families 
from the regions and from the outer suburbs of our big cities from getting a crack at uni in the first place. So looking at some of those barriers, uh, as, as you call them, the report says one is the cost of living while you're studying. You need to increase financial supports for a lot of these kids, expand access to youth allowance, um, make some sort of payment available for those who have to do pra practical uh, placements in schools yeah. and hospitals. Are you willing to do those sorts of things? We've already done a bit of it. In the, in the budget last year, we increased youth allowance and Oz study. Uh, it talks in this report about extra changes that could be made there. It also recommends ideas like a jobs broker. So while you're at university, getting the chance to be paid to work part time in an area that you're studying in. You know, I spent a fair amount of time while I was at university cooking cheese toast at Sizzler rather than in the area that I ended up working in or the mm. area where I was studying in as a law degree. So it says that's an area where you can help people with the cost of living. And you're right, on paid prac, it makes the point, if you're a nursing student, you know, you're spending 800 hours working in a hospital where you're not paid. If you're a teaching student, about 600 hours through the course of your degree in the classroom where you're not paid. Often you've got to move to do the paid prac. Often you've got to give mm. up your part-time job. And so, you know, I've spoken to teaching students and nursing students who've, who've told me that they can't afford to do that. They've done the theory, but they can't afford to do the prac, so they drop out. Or they end up sleeping in a car because they can't afford to pay the rent or to pay the bills. So it's recommending there that governments invest in paid prac for teaching students and for nursing students and work with industry on providing more support for work integrated learning in other areas. So what are you, are you going to do it? Are you the minister? Or are you going to give them some sort of payment? Well, we're not responding to the report today, but it strikes me as, as the sort of area where governments need mm. to work together on this because it can be the difference between whether students finish their degree or not. In teaching, for example, only about 54% of teaching students who start a degree finish it. The average across university is 70%. Now, we've got, a, you know, we've got a, a teacher shortage crisis in this country. If we could increase the proportion of teaching students who finish their degree, we would go part of the way to tackling that crisis. Talking about uh, teaching courses, uh, they did become cheaper uh, under the Morrison government's Jobs Ready Graduates program, along with a bunch of other courses trying to get more kids into them. But uh, arts, humanities, law degrees uh, became a lot more expensive. The report recommends ditching that yeah. scheme. Will you ditch it? Well, if the purpose was to reduce the number of students doing arts degrees, it didn't work. I think Raf made the point a minute ago. Uh, with the more people studied arts degrees after this change came into place <laughs> than before it. Um, you know, it's, it, I guess, a, a classic example that people pick the subjects they do at university based on what they love, what they want to do, the profession they want to go in, rather than that deferred hex payment. Making changes here is costly and, 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 and difficult. I think Raf also mentioned this tertiary education commission, which mm. would look at how you'd move to a new funding model it strikes me that's the sort of thing that they would have to look at and how you would make that change. So that might take some time, setting up the commission first before you then change the course fee structure. Yeah, we've got to make a decision if we set the commission up or not, but it strikes me as a good recommendation. It's the sort of thing that helps to make sure you build long sustained reform. Remember, mm. this is a blueprint not for the next couple of years, but for the next two decades. Over that time, there'll be plenty of different ministers, plenty of different governments, even different vice chancellors. And what, what we've been proposed to us here is a commission that can help to drive and sustain reform in higher education over those two decades. What, just on that, how would that work? Would that commission allocate funding to different universities? Potentially, yeah. There's different models uh, that have been suggested. The report also recommends that if we go down this path, we set up an implementation advisory committee to look at the detailed structure of it mm. and make sure that we get the legislation that would underpin it right. Um, but the report makes the point that all universities pretty much look the same at the moment. Roughly the same number of students teaching the same sort of subjects and says we'd benefit from a bit more diversity. Different universities doing different, doing different things, mm. some bigger, some smaller, making sure that we've got universities where they're needed. You know, when I grew up there was no university near me. Uh, you had to head a long way to get to university and it meant for a lot of kids in my classroom they felt university was somewhere else for someone else. I want to make sure that we make it easier for, for, for kids growing up in our outer suburbs and the regions to get a crack at university and that's, that's part of what this commission can do. You mentioned the hex debts or the help debts that uh, um, particularly a lot of low income graduates are uh, absolutely struggling with. The report talks about this, makes a bunch of different recommendations. Can you give people any hope that they are going to get an easier go when it comes to their student debts? 
You know, it's got recommendations around indexation, but also how you could potentially reduce HEX payments. The, the report says we've got to make HEX simpler and fairer. You know, it says HEX is a good system. HEX blew the doors of universities open uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. When, when Hawke and Keating introduced HEX with, with John Dawkins, there was only about 5% of the Australian workforce had a uni degree. Now it's more than, than 26%. But this report says we've got to make it fairer and simpler. And uh, Bruce Chapman, the, the architect of HEX, has helped the panel with a recommendation that says that there are ways to reduce upfront payments for people on low incomes. So, for example, uh, if we were to go down this path, it says that someone on an income of $75,000 a year would pay every year about $1,000 less. So that's something that could provide an immediate cost of living benefit for people after they finish uni and they're in the workforce with cost of living on top of the tax cuts that we've introduced and that will hopefully go through the Senate this week. So what you're flagging there about a $1,000 benefit for someone on 75 grand, is that something we might see in the budget? Well, we have to go through the whole plan over the next few months. We'll respond to the accord over the course of the next few months. Can't do all of this don't have to do all of this right away. This is bigger than one mm. budget, but we do need to get started now to build the foundations for long-term reform, and we'll respond on that recommendation on, and on all the others. I mean, the other recommendation, we, you, you hear a lot of um, people complaining about this, is the timing of indexation. So they'll make their payments, paying off their student debt all year, but then they get the indexation kick in that covers the stuff they've already paid off all year. It's a, a double hit. Can you mm. fix that up? Well, that's one of the things that we asked the Accord to look at. They've given us a recommendation about that. They've also given us a recommendation about how you index HEX, or what is now called HELP, uh, and recommending that it be set according to the wage price index rather mm. than CPI. So on all of those recommendations, we'll look at those and cost those and prioritise what we do first uh, in our response that we'll put out the next few months. In the next few months. So there will be something in the budget. Well, I hope so. I've got to go through the ERC mm. process, not the ABC process. <laughs> okay, well, I'll persist. Uh, on the cost, I mean, as you say, some of this is longer term, but do you have any idea what sort of price tag implementing this accord uh, would carry and how willing are you to actually stump up and, and make these changes? Well, mate, I'm determined to drive reform in higher education, but also in school education and early education. This is all connected. You know, we're not going to be successful in what this report tells us we need to do in, in hitting that 80% target if we just rely on reforms that start at the university gate. You made the point in your intro that not enough young people are finishing high school. Over the last five or six years, we've seen a decline in the number of people finishing high school, particularly at public schools and particularly young people from poorer backgrounds. They're the same kids that are more likely to fall behind at primary school. They're the same kids that are less likely to go to early education. This is all connected. And so we need reform in early education, in school education and in higher education if we're going to hit these targets and build a better and a fairer education system. There, there is one recommendation in this report for how you'd find some additional money uh, to do some of these things. This is the Higher Education yeah. Future Fund where you'd have contributions from higher performing universities creating a $10 billion fund uh, with an asset, uh, with an income stream then to, to help some of those who are struggling. Look, um, as you would have seen, the Sydney University Vice-Chancellor Mark Scott says it's a tax dressed up as a fund. Are you going to go down this path? Mate, I've got an open mind. As you say, there are some universities who hate it. There are other universities who, who love it. You know, what this is is a fund where the Commonwealth would chip in money, where taxpayers chip in money, but also unis chip in money as well to invest in things like affordable student accommodation and research facilities, classrooms for universities. I think where we all agree is we need more affordable student accommodation. Mm. So whether this is the way to do it or, or, or some other way, I'm keen over the next few weeks and months to talk to universities and others about whether this is the way to do it. One of the other concerns on this one uh, from the Deakin University Vice-Chancellor is that you'd see philanthropic donations dry up. I mean, if, if someone makes a bequest to a particular university, they don't necessarily yeah. want that hived off to, a, to another university, do they? No, no. And so that goes to the detailed design. If you went down the path of setting up a fund like this, you'd want to protect that. If you want to encourage philanthropic donations, as you would rightly expect, people want that money spent on certain things. So you wouldn't touch that? 
Well, I don't think so. You know, it, it might be, you know, if you went down the path of setting up a fund like this, people may want to put donations into it. But that's all mm. for detailed mm. design if we choose to set up a fund like this. Now, on school funding, and you, you drew the link earlier between the, the need to really lift those uh, high school retainment rates before you can really get more yeah. people into university and vocational education. It's part <laughs> of the problem here that public schools just aren't funded enough. Well, they're not fully funded. They're not fully funded under that Gonski model. No public school in the country is, except for where you are at the moment in the ACT. Non-government schools are, government schools aren't. At the moment, the states are legally obliged to, to fund up to 75% of what's needed for a public school, and the state, uh, sorry, and the Commonwealth government is obliged to put in 20%. That leaves a 5% gap. And so the negotiations we're having now are about how we fill that gap. What the, the Commonwealth government chips in and what the states chip in, and importantly, what we use that money for, you know, what we tie that money to to make it work, make sure that we invest mm. that money in the sort of things that are going to help to make sure more kids do finish school. And a big part of that is going right back to the start, identifying kids that are falling behind early and intervening early with things like catch-up tutoring, investing in the things that are going to help kids who fall behind to catch up and keep up and finish school. Well, you have done a deal with WA uh, for a 2.5% increase. The other states say that's not enough. They want you to cover that full 5% gap you just talked about there. Are you willing to do that, go that far? Oh, I won't go into the negotiations that we're having with the states, but you're right, we've, we've signed a statement of intent with WA. It means an investment of an extra $700-odd million over the next five years by the Commonwealth. It'll mean that the most disadvantaged schools, public schools in WA, are fully funded from the start of next year. Mm. But you're willing to go and beyond that, all, that for the other states? And, and, and that all public schools in WA are fully funded by 2026. But I want to do a deal with every state and territory to get every public school in the country mm. up to that full funding level and make sure that we tie the money to the things that, that we know work to tackle the sort of problems that exist at the moment, Dave. If you're... Just, just to make this point because this is important and it goes to the Uni Accord report as well. One in three kids from poor families fall behind the minimum standard that we expect in primary school at the moment. And only one in five of those kids catch up by the time they're in high school. That's a big part of the reason why we're now seeing a decline in the number of kids from poor families and public schools finishing high school. You we've got to fix that if yeah. we're going to fix these, these challenges Understand. in this report. You mentioned tying the funding to what's happening in the classroom. Can I ask you, there's a concern, <clears throat> and Labor used to raise this concern in opposition, that under the current arrangements, the states can use, I think it's 4%, up to 4% of, of their contributions to the public mm -hmm. schools for things that aren't necessarily directly related to the classroom. Um, buses for kids to get to school, teacher um, uh, accreditation courses, registration bodies, capital depreciation costs. Can you yeah. close that loophole? Labor did talk before the election about closing it. It's the sort of thing, Dave, that I would expect would be part of the negotiations with right. the states and territories, which we've now kicked off. I think the point I'd make to you... You want them to close is that, is, is, Well, the point I'd make is I want taxpayers' money to glow in the dark. I want parents and teachers to know where the money is going, whether it's in a public school or whether it's in a non-government school. That's mm. the key here. We okay. don't have enough information on that at the moment. Final one, Minister. We, we mentioned the infrastructure issue for public schools. The Australian Education Union on Friday really ramping up the pressure, yep. pointing out uh, you know, how, how the top private schools are spending uh, so much more than the bulk of public schools, five private schools spending more on lavish facilities than more than 3,000 public schools. Yes, that's to do with the fees they charge, but for your part, the Commonwealth does provide uh, $1 billion, I think it is, in capital funding for private schools over four years, mm -hmm. um, but for public schools, not a cent unless you extend the one-year program. Um, will you do that? Well, we're rolling that out, out now. Um, you know, I, we, most, most non-government schools are low-fee paying schools, yeah. David. There, there, there are a bunch where, you know, it costs a king's ransom to go there and they look more like a place where a yeah. king would live. But most are, <laughs> are low-fee paying schools. I, I'm not trying to break the Gonski model. I want to finish it. I want to make sure that we fund our public schools properly. I'm a product of public education and damn proud of it. And I want to make sure that we, we close that funding gap and close the education gap. There's a lot at stake here. I've got to introduce legislation at the end of the year to increase funding for public schools. London to a brick, the Liberal Party will vote against it. And if they win the election next year, they'll rip that up. And if you doubt me, look at what they did last time. So the agreement I strike this year and the election that we fight next year will determine the future of public education in this country, not just for the next few years, but for decades ahead, whether we build a better 
and a fairer education system or not. You're expecting an election next year? I think so. <laughs> OK. Jason Clare, Education Minister, thanks so much for uh, joining us this morning. Appreciate it. Good on you. Thanks, mate. Well, coming up, speaking of elections, we will turn to the Dunkley by-election, which is happening in just six days. But let's continue this conversation first back to our panel, Katina Curtis, Raf Epstein and Sarah Eisen. Just listening to the minister there, there are clearly a lot of things in here that he likes. Mm -hmm. It seems a lot of things that he would, he would like to do, and some uh, more immediately than, than the longer-term stuff. But it sounded like the, um, the HEX uh, issues, yeah. indexation issues might see something in the budget, Katina? Yeah, that, um, and it's also that fits into the narrative of the moment because you can absolutely also brand that as a cost, cost of, of living, living support. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that sort of almost seems like a no-brainer to do something on that. There was a lot of talk around the budget last year around would anything happen on that indexation and the, the sort of mm. weirdnesses that go on, but... Yes. You need a commission before you get a cheaper arts degree, though. Yeah, that's going <laughs> to take some basic time. Implication. Yeah, don't, don't expect those arts, humanities courses to come down in price uh, this year, necessarily. And, and the language as well. Governments need to work together on this. The, I'm glad you used the numbers. That's 800 hours what nurses do not paid. Like, this goes off on talkback and text. Dan you Andrews can do that quicker. You could do that. You can do it quickly, but it's a lot of people. So what Dan Andrews did at the last state election, you just pay a select group of nurses their nursing fees over, say, the next two or three years, their actual uni fees. Great. Mm -hmm. it's one. And then everyone was texting and saying, well, that's fine. But what about all the people who don't then do the placement? Because once you start funding placements, you've got to fund everybody's mm -hmm. placements. And that's when it becomes expensive. And that's why I use the words... Governments need to work together on this. Feds won't do it on and their own. And just on the uh, argument that will be had with the top universities about this higher education future fund, he's open to the idea, but it sounded like he's ruling out um, taking away philanthropic donations yeah. to particular universities. I think he could see the disincentive that that would, would cause, essentially. I did think it was interesting him talking about, you know, that there'll be different VCs in the future in sort of <laughs> reference to some of the criticism today. They're not um, going to be there forever. Yeah, they're not going to be there forever. So I think that is sort of yeah. saying, look, some of this isn't going to be popular but the fact is the people who aren't a fan of it today aren't always going to be there. He was also there. suggesting that people might donate to this Agreed. new HEF yeah. directly, donate to the government's fund. Maybe they will, fund. Yeah. Maybe I mean, they will. Yeah. instead of Maybe donating to one particular to, university. Instead of donating yeah. to the, the uni they went to, they will sort of give up generously who knows? to everyone. Who knows? I think he was talking a big game, as he has for the last 18 months, about equity and accessibility, but that covers so many different things in this report. So You can do stuff on the edges, can't you? Yeah. you know, come from a region, going to work in a region, yeah. come from a particular background, you can do things there. Around the Look, edges, the accommodation, yeah. the regional hubs, the preparatory courses, 25,000 kids do those prep courses to try yeah. to get between uni, uh, high school high and uni, school and yeah. um, you know, the increased financial supports, even the needs-based funding goes to that equity issue. Mm. I think it's, if you talk a lot about this equity accessibility thing, the fact is that the um, accord says, great, if you think it's important, here's a huge shopping list of things and how you navigate that and say this is what we will and won't do will be pretty interesting. Look, let's move on. Great though to have uh, such a meaty chat about <laughs> education. Um, supermarkets, they've been in the, in the gun uh, for a while now. We saw Brad Banducci, the Woolies boss, uh, head to the exits uh, during the week after um, a bit of a train wreck interview on uh, Four Corners, although they insist that wasn't the reason, but gee, the, the timing made it look a bit that way. Uh, we've also had, we, we know there are these various inquiries underway, the government keeps saying we've got inquiries underway, the ACCC, the Craig Emerson inquiry, all looking at uh, supermarkets and, and competition in this um, this sector that doesn't have a great deal of, of competition. One idea that's come forward from the former competition boss, Alan Fells, is for a divestiture power. So a power that could force the breakup of Coles and Woolies, force them to sell particular stores uh, where market power is being abused. This was a report done for the ACTU. Um, the Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, when he was asked about it last week, was you know saying, let's wait and see what these inquiries come up with. I'm not interested in preempting uh, the important work uh, of the ACCC chair or uh, Craig Emerson in this regard. The Prime Minister, though, the other day was more willing to rule this out. We have a private sector uh, economy in Australia and not a command and control economy. We're not the old Soviet Union. So we need to be, we need to be very careful about the language that we use and what we need to do is to put in place proper competition measures so no break-up power, says the Prime Minister. The Nationals leader, though, David Littleproud, is a bit upset about that. He likes the idea of this sort of divestiture power. Unless you have divestiture powers, powers that scale up to the fact that you're allowed uh, to strip them of their stores in a geographical area or some of their chains like B Big W or BWS, uh, they don't fear. They don't fear government. They don't fear the ACCC. 
So you've got the Nationals, and I think the <laughs> Greens on one side uh, here. Um, the Prime Minister's saying no thanks. What do you think? Do we need some sort of break-up power here, Raph? Well, firstly, they could have done it when they were in government, if David Littleproud's a big fan of it. Yep. And to add to, the, to that weight to that, Rod Sims wanted a few things that could have helped the suppliers that are key Nationals constituents. He wanted an unfair practices regime and he wanted a code that was worth more than the paper it is written on. Mm. So they could have ramped up both of those and Rod Sims was talking about those things during the coalition government. Anthony Albanese says he doesn't want to break things up. I think one of the things Rod Sims was talking about is they should decide rather than the supermarkets decide. It's not supermarkets go and buy a block of land and then the ACCC takes them to court. Mm. It's before the supermarket buys a block of land. The ACCC gets to decide, OK, is that going to extend or entrench your power? Um, that is a, you know, that, that would be a big change. I don't know if Anthony Albanese is interested in it. The other thing to think about that, the extend and entrench, it's not just supermarkets, right? If you buy a beer in this country or buy a concert ticket, how many people are happy with the way they bought a ticket to whatever concert? You could actually stop those duopolies extending and entrenching their power. So a lot of consumer and, and voter... flow on from, from doing it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, it's interesting, the thing about the land. I mean, we've had here in Canberra over the last 15 years, the ACT government has actually done a lot of... Um, they put out this plan. They said, we're not going to... We're going to set aside this block of land for this supermarket chain, this block of land for that chain, and they've actually used their, their planning and land release powers in an attempt to kind of make the market a bit more competitive. Now, I don't... I think the Commonwealth government's probably going to get quite to that level of detail across the country, but um, you know it's a, it's a, it's a different approach that to to dealing with the competition thing. And I think yeah. Andrew Lee, who's the competition guru in the government, has made it pretty clear that overseas, where these powers exist, they either haven't been used or they haven't really worked. Well, we know supermarket prices, cost of living is, uh, and you know, generally the, the pressure people are facing is coming up as the number one issue in the by-election in Dunkley, now just six days away. Um, I did go down and, and spend a day there uh, during the week to sort of test the mood uh, on the streets, recorded a podcast down there, which you can uh, check out. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> there it is on the bottom of your screen, uh, Insiders on Background, it's called. A couple of QR codes, one on the left, uh, you, you scan that, that'll take you to the ABC Listen app version. The one on the right is the ABC iView version. Get on board. Anyway, here's what some of the, uh, the voters in Dunkley were telling me. So how would you describe Anthony Albanese, the Prime Minister? Look, he seems a very, a very approachable man. Um, I wouldn't be in his shoes for all the tea in China. He's in a position which is hard to, to back up after the last three, four years we've had, so anybody in that position would still be struggling today. I feel he hasn't done enough. I feel like he made a few promises. I probably can't give you any examples, but he made a few promises um, to get elected and he's brokered a few of his promises, I believe. He doesn't tell the truth. He's uh, always twists things. Uh just doesn't come across as a, a nice genuine guy. Person. Genuine, yeah, exactly. And what about Peter Dutton? What do you make of him? Not much. Um, I think he's just a, he's a little bit of a muckraker at the moment, yeah. Excellent. He's very good on border control. I think he's got a good head on his shoulders. He might not look good on the camera, so to speak, but I think he's got um, good policies. Yeah. I don't really, I don't really know too much about him, to be honest. Anything would be better than Anthony Albanese. <laughs> at this stage. <laughs> Raf, uh, you've done more of the vox popping in Dunkley than I probably have uh, through this campaign. And look, it's never a scientific um, uh, read. Don't downplay the vox pop, David. <laughs> Don't downplay it. You... I, I approached 50, yeah. spoke to 30 when I did my street walk. I think you get a good sense. Those vox pops reflect... There's a ton of people that don't care. All politicians yep. break promises. I had that a few who didn't in. even know there was a by-election. And, <laughs> yeah. and that's... And have, and I had a lot of people who don't know who Peter Dutton is. Yeah. Um, I, I think that it's a, an electorate that is probably like a lot of electorates right now. They're not really particularly engaged or concerned. Is they that good for an incumbent that. government, though? I mean, I made the point during the week that the sense I got was, yeah, obviously people are worried about cost of living, mm. but I didn't feel like there were baseball bats out for Anthony Albanese. I, I didn't get that sense at all. I've been twice, and to be honest, I went, the second time I went to Frankston, I went to the Liberal launch, and lovely people, and I confess my, my big sin, I, was, I probably ate more of the spread than anyone else. It was a lovely spread. But, um, You're a journo. <laughs> Was low, that's low energy launch, man. Like, yeah. that was a low energy group of people. And, and I, they are the best people in a party because they are the people who are standing at pre-poll. They are the people door knocking. Yeah. They don't look like a party. I haven't had anyone in the Liberal Party who's, you know, senior saying they think they'll win it. That was a low energy launch. You don't get 
the sense that it's a seat that's going to move. Mm -hmm. And I know you want to talk a bit about the sort of the issues that are floating around. The things that the coalition are talking about, I don't get the sense that they are talking about those the things. Boats in Dunkley. And the boats and border protection issues. Boats, border protection, <clears throat> and they yeah. are not surfacing in the media outlets that would love to jump on those two issues and have in the past. It's just not enough know. there. Is that the, is that the, is that the problem? Um, well, I can get really technical for you. Peter Dutton's interview on uh, the morning commercial radio program, I did the word count, um, only 20% of that interview was about borders and, and um, right. you know, home affairs and budget and that sort of thing. When the Prime Minister was on the same radio station, it was 7% of the word count. Now, if that radio station isn't picking up and running with borders and home affairs, the, and the Herald Sun that had the ad paid for by Advance Australia, that's the only time that issue got full page treatment in a week. It's the only time it's well, been buried yeah. by the media outlets that usually are keen to talk about. We'll see what happens on Saturday. Then, of course, uh, well, there's the question of what does each side really need to achieve? Dunkley's held by Labor with a margin of 6.3%. They'll probably lose some of that, but most expect they won't lose the seat. Mm -hmm. I also caught up with uh, Cos Samaras, uh, former Labor campaigner, and Tony Barry, former Liberal campaigner, while we were there in Frankston. They're both now with Redbridge. They've been doing focus groups and other work uh, there in Dunkley as well. And they, they both gave me a bit of a sense of um, what's at stake for the two sides and what they need to achieve. If you're losing a Dunkley in Melbourne and you're the Labor Party, then, then there are 12 seats under Dunkley, uh, under Dunkley that are geographically and demographically more challenging for Labor. Seats like Werraway in Sydney, Hasluck in Perth, Blair in Brisbane that are heavily mortgaged, uh, uh, very, very white, and we use diversity as a really important measurement when it comes to um, whether it's, it's good territory for the Labor Party or not. Um, and uh, a lot more difficult for, for Albanese. I think a pass mark is, uh, for Albanese is uh, 52, 53 uh, on a 2PP basis win. Mm -hmm. So a swing against Labor of 3 ish yeah. percent? Yeah, I think that's a pass mark. Um, anything less than that, and I think he's still absorbing pressure. Would you agree with that, Sarah, that uh, if, if Labor cops a swing against them of 3 or 4 percent, that's OK? I mean, particularly given the message that's coming out that I do think has the most resonance, which is if you're not happy, send a message to the government. And obviously with cost of living being so tight and so on, people can look at this as, yeah, I want more to be done. I'm not going to kind of vote for you for that reason. So for that to have that 4% or less sort of swing, I think that would really almost indicate that particular behaviour, which I think is pretty normal when people are so feeling that cost of living pressure. So, yeah, I, I would tend to agree with that analysis. Big announcement uh, for our Navy surface ships during the week. We had the AUKUS submarines last year uh, on, and, and this week came the surface fleet uh, review and the response to that review from the government. We're going to boost the number of warships from 11 to 26, but Katina, it's going to take some time, as is always the way with these things. And in the interim years, the next few years, we're actually going to have fewer ships on the water, is that mm. right? Yeah, that's right. The, a couple of the existing Anzac class frigates, are, they're getting very old, um, but the new ones aren't quite ready yet to replace them. I, I mean, it, it's the plan is ambitious um, and a lot of people said it'll be great if it comes off. Um, and it's that if it comes off, we've seen a lot in defence over many, many, many years. Well, everyone's that, scarred by the history. I know. This, right? it, it all, it all, it, everything seems to take so long to build and always costs a lot more money. Um, I mean, there's a couple of things that seems sensible um, that they're doing in this. So they're saying we're going to get a new type of frigate, uh, which is a very big boat. Um, and But we, we, get, we want 11 of them, but we're going to buy the first three from somewhere that's already making them. So that is sensible. Which is pragmatic. And yep. governments haven't always done this. They've yep. often preferred local shipbuilding jobs. Using defence as an industry yeah, measure. Yeah, but and buying three off the shelf, we're told they won't have Australian spe specifications, so that'll make it quicker. We don't and know cheaper. where they're going to be built. We don't know where we the don't. subs are going to be built. It's well, the frigates unknown. will be built in Perth, yeah. and so the, will the, the new, new ones. The, the, the new ones that yeah. we're buying, but and the um, the new the drone boats or the ghost ships uh, that that. Um, they so just explain of, this too, because so, we're getting a bunch of these drone yeah. ships, but they'll be manned. We're told but with they, the capability to not manned, be manned. But they might be able to right. be not manned. Um, my understanding is 
is that they're basically, someone described them to um, the West Australian as a magazine, a floating magazine. It's not, not a reading magazine, but it's like basically like a, weapons you know, a magazine. weapons magazine yeah. like you have so on a gun. So it's just chock full like of chock full of missiles. things that can right. go boom, right? <laughs> and then it sort of floats along beside the, the big warships and you can use it as a decoy or you can use it to shoot stuff. Um, that's a very crude understanding of what they but these are. are but still in, <laughs> these are still in development in the United States they are, uh, but anyway. But you've got a plan for these things, Raf? So the planning's interesting, right? Um, ten defence ministers in 15 years. Rudd, Gillard, Rudd, Abbott, uh, Morrison, Turnbull. Ten defence ministers. That's just ministers. the PMs, the yeah, defence yeah. ministers. That's Give us that, that list, right? Ten <laughs> defence ministers in 15 years, yeah. right? The continuous naval shipbuilding, the continuous naval shipbuilding, no ship between 2020 yep. and 2032. Australia's not alone in this. Britain, America, like, right. no way. That's how you get a parliamentary or congressional investigation going. Why does it take so long? Why does it cost so much? The actual dollars in the forward estimates, it's $1.7 billion over the next four years. They, they are signalling that, no, no, it's $11 billion out over the decade. It's serious. But it just shows if you have that rotation, uh, the, you know, the revolving door in the minister's suite, the problems play out over the decades. Mm, and, yep. it's, it, like, it's significant. And we have no idea if the things that they are proposing... Don't forget, the Navy shrinks for the first five yeah, years. Yeah. We don't get the Navy we want and that we'd like I mean, to look, have It's a big 15. gamble the op- on the strategic environment, like to say we're going China, to shrink yeah. warships in the water every year yeah, and yeah. underwater drones Labor every year. Labor is saying that, you know, yes, China might do something in the next five. We're not going to war in the next five. Like, by the time these off-the-shelf yeah. ships yep. come in 2029, 20, the first one, I think, um, that's when that starts to become a bit more we might need to act. But when we talk about that five-year time frame, Labor people I'm speaking to are saying, yeah, understood, but... That's good. No, what? Yeah, yeah there you go. It's 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 That's good. The Look, a final one I just want to mention too is the Julian Assange court hearing his final appeal in, uh, in London. Uh, he wasn't well enough to be in court himself for this, but there was, uh, and the ABC's Steve Canane in London pointed this out, quite a sizeable crowd outside and, and the, the significance of those growing numbers might suggest the political pressure building as well for something uh, to happen here. Um, back here we know the Prime Minister has been repeating his view that enough's enough, he should be brought home uh, to Australia. Look, I understand um, talks are underway involving Stephen Smith, the British uh, uh, the High Commissioner in, in London, Kevin Rudd, the, the Ambassador in the United States, the, the Assange legal team as well. Once this court's made a ruling, any decision could have a stay, and that's when I think the Australian government would hope to see a plea deal. The Assange team's not talking about a plea deal, though. I don't know. What do you what do you think? The people who watch the PM's words closer than I say, he's been more explicit in saying that he raised it personally with the president. With Biden. Um, the sense that I get on with both phone calls and texts on, on a radio station is that. The idea, just it's sinking in that everyone else who published this stuff yeah. and the person who leaked it, the people who published it, they're not being pursued. Mm. The person who published it, her sentence has been commuted. Julian Assange wasn't working or living in the States at, at the time he did this. He's not a US citizen. So that concept that people like Barnaby Joyce have been talking about, that the US can extend its legal reach to anyone in any country. I mean, he's been five years in a high security jail in, in London. That concept, I think, is filtering through to more and more people, and I think that leads to the big vote in the parliament. All right. Our panel, Sarah Eisen, Raf Epstein and Katina Curtis, will be back very shortly with some final observations. Time now for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. I'm Mike Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning with the award-winning host of a Rational Fear podcast, the one and only Dan Illick. And a very warm welcome. Oh, thanks very much, Mike. We've got 10,000 awards. <laughs> Dan, there was a time when uh, in government Peter Dutton um, refused to talk about on-water matters and now he's just a gushing fire hydrant of uh, on-water chatter. Yeah, this is the first time the Coalition actually want to start the boats. Yeah. Brett Lethbridge's wedding crashes. Peter Dutton here's about to crash through Anthony Albanese's um, love boat. It's really a scene, isn't it? Yeah. I think this would have had to be one of the happiest moments in the life of Peter Dutton. He even busted out a smile when he was in Parliament congratulating him. <laughs> no, that was really cute, actually. <laughs> Kathy Wilcox, boat people, land ho as he's spying Fearmongering Island. Gave me an idea for a reality TV show, yeah. you know, Fearmonger Island. <laughs> and when you get voted off Fearmonger Island, if you're not fearmongering enough, you go to Manus. <laughs> and for some reason, Barnaby George always has immunity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Johannes Leek, they're all watching the uh, the new director's cut of the movie. I, I guess the director's Peter Dutton. <laughs> That's true. We all watched Fast and Furious 10. 
why can't we watch slow and unseaworthy? Fast is furious, <laughs> Peter Dutton. We've all seen this before. Oi, please, no spoilers. Yeah, in this Peter Brolman cartoon, Peter Dutton seems to think that um, he's asked if we could come back in the week before the next Federal Act. Too early! Dutton is just waiting for a Tampa crisis. Yeah. Just something he could claim to be his own. But yeah. this is not much of a crisis. 39 people. There are more people on a Bucks party. Yeah, well, there's more people in the monkey pod room when they were doing the numbers <laughs> for the spill. Um, from stopping the boats to increasing the fleet this week, the government announced a big increase in defence spending. I love Mark Knight here because he's always got his snail. I hope it doesn't end up like the Titanic. Yeah, mm. yeah. Well, it's OK, Mark, because all these ships they're buying are hypothetical. They haven't even been designed yet. <laughs> I like this um, Albo saying, open your eyes. Yeah. And, I'm flying. And the, the, the Navy person saying, I'm flying. I would have gone with, I'm Vice Admiral of the world. <laughs> David Pope's cartoon, drone ship, crew optional. What do you think of drone ships? What's the go? Oh, that's a good question, actually. Like. Join the Navy, see an Xbox. Join the Navy, control things from home. Yeah, that's Don't it. go anywhere. What an ideal situation. Yeah. I could be in the Navy. You could. Look, Albo, no hands. I think uh, Richard Miles here is skiing behind it. It's a scene from Apocalypse Now where they're skiing behind the patrol boat. Oh, right. Thanks for the reference. Just a beautifully drafted David Rowe cartoon, Dan. Nice Richard Miles here is Captain Mimo. Yeah, I really enjoyed the B1, 2 and 3 because Dutton's about to play Barnaby. Yeah, yeah. The other thing I love is this detail of the participation badge yeah, yeah. from Home Affairs. Home Affairs participation and he's put a D on the P, so he's, he's got P Dutton. It's, it's just all perfect. It's his required sort of cyanitis green here. <laughs> Dan, they say that uh, former CEOs don't die out, they just check out and um, Brad <laughs> Banducci reached his years by date well and truly. Lovely Kathy Wilcox cartoon. I wonder if Coles will price match uh, the special CEO was CEO now out. Oh, this is great. Imagine if this happened to the CEO of Coles, how many down-down jokes there would have been made. It would have been perfect. Downtown. CEOs go down. <laughs> Dean Alston has got uh, the CEO guru as he's checking out with, with his little box of office equipment. He was past his use by date. Look, I've got a feel for Banducci because now he's retired, he'll lose his Woolworth staff discount and we all know how hard it is for retirees to afford anything at Woolworths. Yeah, well, you can't. Yeah, yep. impossible. Yep. Yeah, forget yep. it. <laughs> Finally, um, John Kadelka has, uh, has got him at the self-checkout. I think he's probably waiting for a cash-only machine here. Perfect, yeah. I do love this unexpected item in the bagging area. I think Sean McAuliffe's writer, David M. Green, said it really well. He said unexpected bagging in the interview area. <laughs> that's, that's perfect. <laughs> and Dan John's had some very tough uh, medical news this week. Uh, Our thoughts yeah. to uh, him and his family yeah. at this time. Get well soon, mate. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, mate, it's been a great pleasure on picking the events this week. I'll let you do the honours. No, thanks. Um, back to you, David Spears. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Mike. And our thoughts with John as well. Let's get some final observations. Sarah, to you first. Uh, I think the week coming is a parliamentary sitting week and I'm curious about how The Voice is going to play in. Uh, we've heard in the last week different people coming out to have some criticism about how things have gone. Marshall Langton, Mick Gooder, Greg Craven, all big yes campaigners. The Coalition's going to capitalise on this. They've got a motion next week about saying the $450 million spent on The Voice was divisive, essentially a waste, and then use it to, to springboard all of the things they want, the audits and so on. So I'm curious about how big a role that's going to play as all of us keep asking, what's the plan B post The Voice? Mm. Raf, uh, just watching the Woolies and the Coles CEO on Four Corners, they do not talk the way the people who shop in their supermarkets talk. Uh, they clearly never have people who ever disagree with them. They came across, I mean, you know, Brad Banducci obviously came across badly. The Woolies CEO came across, I mean, in my opinion, as incredibly arrogant. At least they do the odd interview. We have so much reliance on people that provide monopolies. Osnet, Melbourne's just gone through storms, a whole lot of people didn't have power. They never do media interviews. Transurban build roads and take money from a lot of us every day. These people only do investor calls. They never go out there and are actually accountable to the people who, for whom they provide an essential service. They should get out there. There actually isn't that much to be afraid of if you do it regularly. Get on Raf's right show. You're not that scary. Don't have to do my exactly. show. There's, there's a gazillion shows. They don't do any show. <laughs> Katina. Uh, Helen Haynes is going to put a bill to Parliament tomorrow that's around um, grants and it's about providing parliamentary oversight uh, where ministers make decisions contrary to their department's advice. Now, interestingly, um, it's a similar concept to a bill that Katie Gallagher put up when she was in opposition. It goes further than um, 
than the Labor bill, which has sort of mysteriously disappeared. But I actually think the grants issue is a bit of a sleeper issue. We're starting now to get to the grants rounds that are not just the election promises. Now is where we'll see whether Labor's rhetoric about merit and fairness plays out. All right, we will see. Thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Finally, the US has become so politically polarised, even Taylor Swift is a source of division. But here... There's nothing but bipartisan love for Tay-Tay. We'll leave you with these Swifties busting some moves on Friday night. Thanks for watching. making us all feel very excited about being here.